the way Bitcoin transactions are encoded in the software is that there is a list of uh, coins, essentially, and then there's a list of destinations and the amount being sent to each destination. The destinations do not include the fee. Nothing in the transaction tells you what the fee of the transaction is. And the inputs do not tell you the amount of each input. They're just identifiers that are resolved by a full node. So there's no way to tell how many Bitcoins are going into a transaction just with the transaction itself, only how many are total going out. And without knowing how many are going in, you cannot know the fee of the transaction. So basically you need a full node to know the fee of the transaction normally. The way hardware wallets have dealt with this because they need to provide the user with the information to confirm is they would have for each of the inputs, you would have to send the hardware wallet, your computer over the USB or whatever, would send every transaction that created those inputs. And that, that transaction has the amount on the output because that created that in, what is now being used as that input. And so that was a lot of data you would have for, Sending a transaction, you would have to send the hardware wallet, not only the transaction one to send, but also each a transaction behind every coin that you were spending in that transaction. So back a few years ago, for SegWit, the idea was, we'll just have it so that the signature includes the amount of the input in it. So when you're, if, if you sign that the input is one Bitcoin, but the input's really two Bitcoins, the signature is invalid. The idea being the hardware wallet can just trust what the computer is telling it for the amount. And if, it's, if the computer's lying, the signature won't matter anyway. The transaction won't go through. So the problem with this turned out to be if you can lie to the hardware wallet in different ways, you can trick it into giving you signatures that are in back. You could, you would, the first transaction you would send it You'd have, say, to have two coins for the input. If it's uh, 30 Bitcoins and then 20 Bitcoins is the example that Trezor used. So you've got a 30 Bitcoin coin and a 20 Bitcoin coin. You tell the hardware wallet that one of those coins is much smaller than it is and the other coin is bigger than it is. Um, 20 and 30 might not be the best examples for reasons I'll get into later, but the hardware wallet will then sign for both inputs. Each input has its own signature. And that transaction is invalid because it, your computer lied about the amount of the uh, input. But if you trick the user into, you say, now, if the computer says, this signature failed, try again. Your hardware wallet will then again ask you. And then if you confirm it a second time, it's also giving, computer in this case is also lying the second time it's saying the other input is the wrong size. So now you have two different invalid transactions, but the signatures on each input in those are valid, but the opposite one is invalid. So you throw away the invalid signatures and you take the valid signatures and combine it to a new transaction. And what this does is now you have a valid transaction with signatures on both inputs and the outputs are what it told you, but the fee is completely different because you have the true value of both inputs in there. And one reason this isn't as concerning necessarily is that the user has to be socially engineered to sign the transaction twice. They have to tell their hardware wallet, they have to approve the transaction twice, which, you know, if the computer is malicious anyway, it can just make them both be valid transactions and send the transaction twice. The reason that doesn't negate it entirely is that the hardware wallet could be telling you that it's 0.01 bitcoins for each of the transactions and you could be thinking well that's no big deal if i send it twice i send it twice or maybe a smaller amount <laughs> but that doesn't that 0.01 may not be the fee that you're being tricked into sending the fee you're being tricked into sending could very well be you know the whole wallet worth so it's not entirely harmless either i Hope that explained everything. Is there any questions or anything I wasn't clear about? <laughs> well, the, worst, the worst case scenario is that your funds could be drained from your hardware wallet. Is that correct? Pretty much, yeah. Um, that's a pretty bad scenario. But, <laughs> but, but the, yeah. the attacker's not really gaining the fee 
it's whatever miner picks up and mines it. So it's more of a Potent grief kind of thing. <laughs> or, yeah. Potentially. Um, if the attacker is a miner, they can just not broadcast it until it's mined in their own block. But I don't know how probable that is with mining being as centralized as it is. It'd be pretty obvious that a miner was, well, maybe not. A miner could just claim that it was broadcast, but. So. Uh, There's only so many miners that could really pull it off. <laughs> So there are different different hardware wallets chose to solve this problem in different ways, right? I think Tre uh, Trezor they they did something where it kind of broke backwards compatibility. Gold card kind of made you opt into it, right? Um, could you well, the <laughs> the uh, the solution Trezor went with, which is pretty straightforward, was they just treated the SegWit transaction as a non-SegWit transaction. They sent over the transactions behind every input just like they did before basically just not using that feature of segwit okay so how does that break because people were saying that now you can't use treasure with other software like you can't use treasure with btc pay anymore well the, the software on the computer has to know that you're treating it as a non-segwit even okay. though it's segwit right. but whereas right previously to all this the software assumed if it's a segwit they don't need to send the transaction for that because the signature will be just signed anyway. So now that they've changed this, that software has to send the input transactions for everything, even if it is SegWit. Could you kind of um, talk through, uh, you know, from your perspective, how, if you were to, if you developed a hardware wallet, right, how would you roll out a fix to this bug, right? And what kind of things would you keep in mind um, while still maintaining like security as like your number one feature in your hardware wallet? Well, if security is the number one feature, then you compromise on compatibility with old software. So yeah, you break compatibility with all the software out there, but that's just temporary until that software gets updated. In the meantime, you at least have the security of knowing that you're not vulnerable to this attack. Um, you could also tell people, if you don't want to upgrade until your software is ready, simply be aware of this problem and don't sign multiple times. <laughs> No matter how small the amount may appear, because then, because then they might, for whatever reason, you might be signing a a, a transaction you didn't intend, and therefore your your right. drain. I mean, the transaction will be more or less the same, the same amount being sent, but okay. the fee would be a lot larger than you intended to send. It could be a tiny amount, but still, but the fee may be wrong, and it may be your entire wallet being sent as the fee. So, as an attacker, like they wouldn't get the funds. All that would just go to to the miner. Unless the attacker was the miner, yeah, or had some agreement with the miner. <laughs> okay, which is what Steve was saying. Okay, got it. Cool. Was this? You said that this was a feature of Segwit. Was this? Uh, was this an unintended feature? Like, or was this a? I mean, obviously the bug is unintended, but the uh, to try to make the hardware wallet interface send less data was that kind of one of the intentions, or just something the? Yeah, that was a planned feature. Um, I mean, if you go to bitcoincore.org and see the SegWit FAQ. It's got a whole section on how it works. Uh, okay, interesting. So this was an unforeseen consequence? Yeah. Um, I mean, the solution that's being, even before this exploit was announced, it was in Taproot that it was just going to sign the amounts of all the inputs to prevent this. So Taproot would have addressed this also in that case? Because it- right. Tapru is going to address this as soon as it gets deployed. Okay. But were they were they doing it for another reason, or was it because of recognizing this sort of problem? I think it was sort of recognizing it, but not necessarily recognizing the security aspect of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> security implication. Right. Right. Interesting. Just more motivation now. So I guess one question I had is like, were people aware of this problem since for a long time and it's just recently come to light or um, was this a recent discovery? Um, I didn't hear about it before Trezor announced it, but I think Trezor said that it was revealed to them. I don't know if it was one or three months previously. Yeah. And other, other hardware wallets, I guess it asked for more time to fix it. It's kind of crazy because you have SegWit and that's been deployed for over a year now. 
three years now almost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for several years. And just now we're finding out a vulnerability like this. It's, it's crazy to me that on other blockchains, people are developing new technologies and new formats and new languages. And yet they're saying, and, and I think they slap, you know, oh, we put a security on it, on it, so you can, you can trust it. But I've got to say, you know, like Bitcoin Core Tech has, is so rigorously um, scrutinized, I think. And even yet, three years later, we find a bug like this. Yeah. Uh, the review process is definitely a good idea. I don't know if it provides as much security as people assume it does. Things that slip past one person may very well slip past 10 people or whatever. <laughs> right. Is, this, is there something with HWI that gets changed here? Um, it looks like, but. Bitcoin Core is going to probably need updates to handle this as well. Right now, it will also not provide the transactions if there's a SegWit input. Um, that's being changed. It also actually used to reject PSBT, the partially signed Bitcoin transactions, as invalid. I don't know if it was invalid or some other phrase it was used, but it would reject those if they had the input transaction for a SegWit input. So that's probably a compatibility issue that will have to be addressed, but that may get backported into... 021. Uh, actually, I put that fix into Bitcoin, not 020. So if you, if it does become an issue, it's, there are options. But you said there's a fix in 2020 or? Not. Oh. My derivative of Bitcoin Core that has a bunch of enhancements and sometimes fixes. Okay. Back to it. It's still, uh, it's still in the review process for Core. So mm -hmm. it may take a few months. Okay. Um, so if anybody else have, has any other questions, feel free to um, write them in the chat or, and, I'll, and I can ask them on your behalf. Um, but I guess one question I had, Luke, was do you have a general sense of how long it will take for something like Taproot to get reviewed and then implemented onto Core, like a timeline? Mm, not really really depends on how much time people put into it. There are some bug fixes that have sat for years before finally getting merged and hopefully Taproot won't be like those, but it's uh, it's got a lot more enthusiasm, I think, than some of the other pull requests, so hopefully it'll get reviewed quicker. I feel like there's not a lot of people who are against it, if any. I haven't heard of anyone against it. <laughs> I think um, there's going to be another proposal that we're going to talk about later in this Socratic seminar, and I want to hear about your thoughts on it. But yeah, does anybody else have any other questions? What I think might be an issue is um, the activation method. <laughs> there's some disagreement about what the best way to go approach that at this point is. Segwit, we had tried to do the minor activation again, but obviously that didn't work out, and we had to switch to user activated, and there's it's never quite clarified in everyone's mind what the best way to do a user activated soft fork is going forward. Um, would you mind kind of laying out the different um, options that people are currently considering? Um, Maybe like I guess, yeah. I guess the main two ideas is to do a minor activated soft fork, but if the miners don't do it within so much time, then it just becomes active on its own as if it had never been inactive. Um, that was, it's kind of similar to what BIP 149 was that did not get used for SegWit, where it, suddenly the rule just starts applying one day and we just hope that there's enough people enforcing it and there's no real way to tell. The other approach which we used for SegWit and which I think we should probably continue to use is um, similar to BIP 148 where you have a month or whatever of blocks that explicitly say, okay, this is activating. Even if it, you know, you've got the signaling before that for several months before the final activation, but that last block before, while well, it's locked in, should it require the miners to explicitly say, yes, I've upgraded. Yes, this is, we, we understand these rules are coming into effect. In this way, everyone can be sure that 
when it is activated, it is actually activated. The rule is expected to be enforced. There's no question whether Taproot is active or maybe not active and just working by chance. Okay. Um, so the first one kind of sounds like you're, you're almost forcing the miners, like, do this by this time or else you're off the network. Um, and the second well, one... Miners, miners never have a choice in the matter. It's all about what the users want. Um, okay. Miners either go along with it or they are mining an altcoin. Um, the difference lies in whether, whether the blockchain itself is committing to the new rules, whether the chain says these are the rules that are now in effect, or whether it's just an assumption that the rules are in effect, but nobody really knows until they try to attack it. And usually nobody does try to attack it so it leaves it kind of an open question you know it's it would be like it, we wouldn't know today if segwit was active or not because nobody there would be no clear indication if we had done this with segwit it'd be uh yeah we, we'd be able to say sure nobody's attacked my segwit coins but there'd be no way to know for sure if someone did attack those segwit coins would they succeed or not is there a fail option? Like, let's say, like, because the second option sounds like it's based on percentage, right? Like, a certain amount of miners have to start signaling that they're going to implement this new fork. Is there, like, a fail option to that? Both options allow miners to indicate that they're ready to protect old nodes early. So it could be a month or two months, and the miners can trigger it to activate early. The question is, what happens if the miners don't do that and it goes on for a year or two before, or maybe a little shorter, I don't know. That's another question that needs to be addressed, it's the time frame. Um, so what happens if it's been a year, the miners haven't bothered to upgrade yet? If the community is going to activate it anyway, do we explicitly have the chain signal that it's going to be upgraded or do we just assume it has upgraded and hope for the best. <laughs> Got it. So uh, I have a couple questions about uh, Taproot in general. That uh, Taproot, when, it, when it's going to go into production, uh, will it be limited to opcodes or would it more look like uh, Ethereum Solidity? Would it be more open to different uh, development? Uh, do you know, Luke? Or well, the one of the main ideas behind Taproot is that in most cases you can have this you can have this script that says these are the rules who can spend it who can't spend it and in most of the cases if both parties to the transaction agree then you don't need to bother evaluating the rules you can just have both people sign it so in most cases it will short circuit to a multi sig the only time it would actually have a program run in the script would be if one of the parties is refusing to cooperate. And hopefully the fact that you can fall back to running that script will be an incentive to just basically always cooperate because what are you gonna do? It's not gonna stop anything from happening. How about creating a complex multi-sig wallets? For example, a two of two wallets when, where one of the signers is actually a multi-sig. Would, would that become possible? I believe the Schnorr signatures that are included in Taproot make that possible, but that script is kind of over my head. <laughs> I got it. All right, thank you. That, that was my question. All right, well, Luke, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate you, uh, you breaking down the new segwit vulnerability. And um, yeah, so uh, I would say let's give you a hand. But <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, Luke. I'm gonna start recording, stop okay. recording now.